No one completely understands Amazon's ranking algorithm. Sprinkle a little science on it. Yeah, bring in, bring in some Ryan and it's like- Were there people screaming at you to get back into the field? My own brain, I think, was the <laughs> biggest. This is the Startup Knockout Podcast, smacking you in the face with German startup scene. I'm your host, Timo Hicks. This is our second pilot episode, and this one's a little bit special for me. We're looking at a company that made it big on Amazon and just recently had an exit. Now, this is not your typical tech startup, but they had phenomenal growth after starting from literally nothing. Now, these pilot episodes are meant to be just as much practice for me as they are info for you. But I really love Ryan's story. He worked his way through academia, through biotech startups and finally found a home building high quality brands and products. Any entrepreneur will find it easy to empathize with this kind of hero's journey. So here's my conversation with Ryan Sherrard for your viewing and listening pleasure. Welcome, welcome to the Startup Knockout Podcast. I'm your host, Timo Higgs. We're here today with Ryan Sherrard. Uh, now this is, this is a treat for me because Ryan and I, first, we're both from Canada and we've been friends for a while. Canadians that found each other here in Munich. And this is a really interesting story about how Ryan came from something completely different into the world of e-commerce and smashed it. So we're really glad to have him, get some of his insights and hear a little bit more about his story. Ryan, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for that amazing intro, Timo. Love it. <laughs> glad to be here, man. No problem at all. Okay. So we're going to start out a little bit with your background. You started in cell and molecular biology that's very high profile. And I read from your bio, you focused on post-transcription regulation of program cell death using nematode C elegans as a model organism. That sounds like a couple of biologists got together and said, we're going to try and create a job title that no one can understand but us. Is uh, yeah. that about right? You absolutely nailed it, man. Um, going back a little bit, I had always had a fascination for science. I loved learning about science. I loved opening my textbook and learning biochemical pathways and all that stuff. I was a complete nerd. I just soaked it all up. I couldn't wait to get into it. So yeah, I applied to the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry and it led me down this really cool rabbit hole of studying mRNA and how mRNA is regulated. And if you've been listening to the news lately, you know, with the pandemic and COVID and RNA vaccines, RNA has become a very sexy world, uh, sexy word in the in the world right now. So I think where this story is going to go or where it could have very well gone is just as the world was opening up and becoming this great place for RNA scientists, <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> he pivoted to a completely different field. Were there people screaming at you to get back into the field? Like my, uh, my own brain, I think was the <laughs> biggest, it's the biggest thing to overcome. Cause you're, you're moving away from a field that you were in for, you know, 15, 20 years. And there's that little voice in your head. that's like, is this, is this what I want to do? I think what it came down to is I realized that science, I loved learning about science, but I didn't necessarily like doing science. Just at that moment where I was starting to question my whether I wanted to do science, this new opportunity came into my life. So that's that's what took over. Yeah, uh, I can totally understand that. I had a similar experience, but much, much earlier in my life when I was in university that I found out that I hated lab work because I actually started <laughs> in sciences, hated the lab work, loved the textbook stuff. And also I nearly failed chemistry in first semester. So that got me out of that pretty quick. <laughs> um, everyone's got that story everyone's got that story. <laughs> there's a lot of people with that story <laughs> okay so before we get to the e-commerce stuff and the thing that you've been doing for the past little while let's talk real quick about deoxy sure. so this was a biotech startup that you got into right after your phd right exactly Tell us a little bit about Deoxy and how you got involved in that. Yeah, so towards the end of my PhD, I was I was starting to question if I wanted to continue in science or not. And I, I thought to myself, the only way I want to stay in science is if I get out of this academic bubble. And just as I was having these thoughts, my buddy Yo or Johannes, he uh, he approached me because we had worked a little bit together during our PhDs. And we just kind of kept in touch and he said, Hey, do you want to go grab a beer? I'd love to love to catch up. And I just thought he just, you know, wanted to go have a, have a chat, have a beer, nothing of it. And he, en he ends up offering me a job at his, uh, at his startup. 
had his biotech startup and I was like, this is perfect for me right now. And I, I didn't even think on it. You know, I think normally people are the smart thing to say is, oh, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you after the weekend. I said, I said yes on the spot because it just so perfectly aligned with what I wanted to do at that moment. And it was still based in Munich. And so all, everything just seemed to be like, yes, let's go do this. The whole project was um, also based around RNA, what genes are on and off. You can infer things about the health of that cell. So it all seemed really cool. It was kind of cutting edge technology. And so I was really drawn into this project and really excited. And that was back, yeah, that was that was back in 2018, I think is when I got started with them. So after you'd kind of dove into that and you were in that world of the startup biotech, I know that Deoxy and e-commerce were running parallel for you for a little while. So how did that all play out from Deoxy into the world of e-commerce? I have a buddy here, another Canadian who lives not too far away from me, just five minutes away. Um, he wanted to do a side hustle. So he had started up this Amazon uh, side hustle where he was selling you know, giftable products on Amazon. And, but the more and more I saw Dave working on this, I was kind of looking at him on the side being like, wow, this is, this is a whole new area and boy, is it cool. And so what I, I, I slowly integrated into my, into my schedule where I would go and do deoxy, you know, the solid, you know, nine to nine to five, nine to six, whatever. But when I would get home, I would always set aside a couple of hours for working on the Amazon business. It's, it happened over several months, but you could slowly see that deoxy was, was had maybe going to hit, um, hit a rock wall and not be able to recover. So it was really a fork in the road. Like I could see the two paths clear as day. Both very promising, but something about the e-commerce draw, you know, and selling online, selling on Amazon and all the things that come with that. I think just the novelty of it really drew me in and it just excited me more than staying in science. And so I decided to make the full transition and say, yep, I'm going to, I'm going to dive into e-commerce and this is going to be my full-time job and enjoying this whole new world that is not science. Yeah, I guess it's it's easy to underestimate sometimes how big of a drawing force just novelty can be. Yeah. Something new, something you've never done before, something yeah. that's just And I don't want to call it like a quarter life or third of a life any kind of crisis. <laughs> like it was just I really thought a long time. It took a long time for me to process and I was like, okay. so it wasn't scary in the sense of like oh God, I might not have a job. I not, might not mm. be able to go back into the science, but it was scary and like just mentally thinking like, can I change? Can I mm. do this? Changing your identity when your identity is really tied up in what you do for work, I think yeah. is harder than most people think, but yeah, it definitely and... helps when you've got a PhD, especially here in Germany. It's like walking around with a golden ticket being like, who wants to hire me? And they're all like, uh, we do. I love to think that now that I'm in e-commerce, I bring such a different skill set than anybody else in e-commerce, like running experiments to determine, okay, which product is performing better? Let's test this out. So my business partner, Dave, being a pilot, he loves systems and SOPs and you know, having a backup for a backup for the backup. So we, we actually, as different as we are, we really complement each other really well. We've had a lot of success because of how different we are. And I think a lot of people, when they're jumping into a business, maybe and trying to find a partner, they're looking for someone who's just like them because, you know, you'll get along with them best and it'll all be, it'll be, it'll be great. But, um, I found from working with someone who is polar opposite to me, it, it, we, we cover all grounds when it comes to the business. So it's been really, really a fun adventure to, to work with him. Cool. Let's, let's back up just a tiny bit to the decision to leave the world of science and dive in full, I was like feet first into the world of e-commerce. Um, first thing I'm interested in is how much momentum did you have with the e-commerce stuff at this point? Was it already starting to take off or was this really a gamble for you? The first product that Dave launched when I wasn't involved, it was a, it was a dud. Like it didn't uh -huh. sell. It sold like one a day. It wasn't really a sexy business at that point. You made it sexy? Yeah, well, that's why essentially he, he called, like I offered to help and he's Sprinkle like- Sprinkle yeah, a little science on it. Yeah, bring in, bring in some Ryan. And it's like, you know, he was he was being spread thin. He needed some new ideas. So I, I joined him and together we went down these rabbit holes of like keyword research and SEO and advertising, PPC. If you're in e-commerce, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's all of these new shiny things that you just start learning about. And using this knowledge, we- we did product research and we were able to launch 
on a just a very small scale two new products and those products took off out of the gate hmm. and we're like wow are we were you still at deoxy at that point i was this was just about at the end of deoxy that's when i really saw the value because up until that point it was just break even it was it was fun to do on the side but that's when we started to say like okay if we can launch these two products and make them successful then let's take those exact same methods and strategies and launch five new products six new products when i saw it really start to take off i'm like this is an opportunity i can't pass up and that's when i bought into dave's business so i took i i bought it into a third of his business and he held on to two thirds and then we were full business partners in it together so how was that experience when it was so vastly international? You know, like how did how did that work when wow. you're living here, you're working here technically, but your business is kind of elsewhere? Um, particularly interested in how that worked with sort of like ger German bureaucracy and setting things up abroad. Was that a lot of a headache, or or was that actually fairly easy for you guys? Like, what did that look like? Already, Dave had set up the business in the mm. states, so. What he set up was an LLC, a limited liability company in Wyoming. Mm, and so lovely. Uh, the, they're treated as a disregarded entity and it's essentially a tax flow through. So you don't have to pay any corporate tax in the US. So all of your tax is assessed in Germany. So that creates a very simplified, um, yeah, kind of business structure. If we eventually wanted to sell the LLC, which that was our goal, rather than own the LLC um, personally, uh, why not set up, each of you set up a GmbH here in Munich and have your GmbHs own respectively one third and two thirds of the LLC in the States. That way, when you sell the LLC, you only have to pay a tiny percentage of the, of the wins to transfer the money to the, to your German holding companies. And then they can sit, the money can sit in your holding companies and you can make further investments before having, before paying it out to you and losing, you know, that additional, you know, what is it? 27% in income tax or 42 or whatever it is. And thankfully Dave was more the guy who worked on the business and looked after all these things. So I was very happy. And this is again, a, a, an argument for having a business partner that is has completely different skill sets to you. Cause if it was up to me to set up this business structure, I would have probably just rolled over and like assume the fetal position and been like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was just completely overwhelming to me. I wouldn't have known where to start. So it was great to have Dave, you know, take the lead on that. Yeah. Are you listening? Any potential startup founders pay for good advice? Uh, I heard this first from you and I've taken your advice found myself a good tax advisor and a good lawyer who are also advising me on the same thing, set up some holding uh, structures to make sure that you're getting the best of the system, Absolutely. which the alternative how would I have known? The, the alternative is going down a rabbit hole on Google or YouTube and, and listening to these self-proclaimed gurus. And, mm. and Dave always says this too, you're either going to pay for mistakes um, or you're going to pay for learning. And why not just pay for, for the learning and learn how to do it right and pay the right people. So pay, pay for the expertise. Don't pay for the mistakes. <laughs> well, that's a good one. I'm going to write that down on my wall. Now let's get into kind of the growth phase of your company. So I saw on your website, and we've talked about this a little bit over beer after climbing once. Yeah. Um, you guys were very specific about setting goals and it shows it on your website, which I thought is... First of all, it's a brilliant marketing technique, and it also just shows how focused you guys were on just upward. Yeah. And your goals were like first profitable, which was a, a modest goal, but could have seemed out of reach when you were right at the beginning. Absolutely. And then 100K a month, a million a year, a million a month. And then how high did you get up? I think we, so our, our peak was a million in five days. <sighs> yeah. Mind blowing. That's a good week. <laughs> you wake up in the morning, you're like, we sold $35. And then going to that, that is, that's a huge scaling. That's a huge climb indeed. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm curious between each of these goals, were you changing strategies? Were you changing any of your operations or was it just doing more of the same to get you up to that next goal? It was, it was a little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, once we launched these two initial successful products and we realized we were onto something we we did get funding i know and i know before i said like we we didn't i don't think of us as a startup because we didn't have to go get funding but this funding was actually pretty straightforward to apply to um, is this company who just gives um low interest capital 
to to Amazon sellers who need money to buy inventory. And sure, that's very different do. from VC capital. Very different, and they take yeah. no equity, so they just they just give you money for for inventory, and they 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 charge you a, a small cost of capital to pay it back. So, and so I think when you look at our growth, we went from seventy three thousand revenue in our first year, which was twenty twenty. And then 20, um, 2021 was 3.1 million. <laughs> and then 2022 last year, um, we, we sold the company halfway through, so I don't know the exact final numbers, but it's going to be somewhere around, yeah, four and a half to 5 million revenue. So it's, it's just this crazy growth that was really only possible because we had the foresight to be like, we need to buy a lot of inventory. We went in and got mm. that funding. Um, but underneath all that, we had a system, so we just kept launching new products and new products, and we we had a, a very specific system for launching our products on Amazon that came with, you know, really detailed SEO keyword research, great photography on the listings, generating great reviews, all of this. So we we had that that kind of SOP for launching products, and we just kind of duplicated that and we kept launching new products to grow the portfolio, and that also helped the growth. Yeah, that's interesting. I like the the idea of you guys just taking money kind of to put you into a, another gear. So like you're shifting into a higher gear so that you can really push and sell more. Um, but I'm wondering, um, oftentimes with these stories, you get the beginning of the story and then you get the end of the story, but the middle is never quite as smooth <laughs> as as people um, necessarily understand. And I'm, I'm wondering about times where you might have stumbled or where you hit challenges where you weren't sure if you could hit the next milestone. I mean, I could, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting to the meat of the story. <laughs> As two guys trying to manage Amazon sales, we also were on walmart.com, also managing our, our manufacturer in China, the supply chain, the freight forwarder, our, where our 3PL um, logistics warehouses in the States, um, ranking on Amazon between all that and just two guys doing it, plus all the business structure and taxes and bookkeeping. It's yeah, we, we made a lot of mistakes, but we were always really good at, at putting out those little fires. And to me, that's the draw that I, that's one of the things I do love about e-commerce is I uh, definitely over science is e-commerce to me every day was getting up and saying, what little fires do I have to put out today? And identifying them and just and just putting them out. And it's very tangible stuff. It's like, cool, I need to do this, this, this. Like there were things where containers, you know, we we would send we were sending over entire shipping containers from China to LA. And the container would just sit in a parking lot for weeks and we would get in trouble from the from the landowner. Your sales on Amazon are so tied to your rank, your organic rank, and where you appear on the search results page. And that is completely up to Amazon's algorithm. So you're completely at the mercy of the algorithm. And if you would wake up one morning and you're used to be ranked, you know, top five and you've dropped down to, you know, number 50, then it's, it's like, how did that happen and why? And how do we recover sales? So there, there were lots of those. There were lots of inventory issues, staying in stock, things going wrong with shipping. They were actionable. You could solve them in a, in a, short period of time and then learn from them and learn to never put, put systems in place so that you never make that same mistake again um, and kind of continue growing that way. Were these trip ups like falling down the ranking, was that in your control or was that your competitors doing something or was that the algorithm or was it different every time? It's probably, it's different every time and it's all of the above. It could be a competitor doing something. It could be Amazon changed their algorithm overnight. Mm -hmm. It could be that, you know, your inventory is, is going down. And so Amazon is showing you less and less because they can't fulfill you as quickly to a customer. So there's, there's so no one completely understands Amazon's ranking algorithm. And yet as an Amazon seller, you're completely at the mercy of it. It could be the difference between you selling, you know, a thousand units a day or 50 units a day. It's all comes down to your organic ranking. And of course you can pay to be shown on the top of the page. You can run sponsored ads, but you're paying for that. So that cuts in, you know, to your profitability. And Amazon is unfortunately going more and more in that direction where they're becoming more of a pay to play plat platform. If you go on Amazon today and you search for anything, you'll notice just how much of that top of the page is, is advertising. Mm -hmm. And 
you have to scroll down quite a bit to get to the first, you know, organically listed product. Yeah, I've so, that too. So nowadays, necessarily having you know a good organic rank doesn't oh, it doesn't translate into sales like it used to. It's now becoming mm-hmm. you got to pay to be at the top of the page to even have the customers consider your product. Sure. Um, okay, so let's jump ahead now to the end of this e-commerce story. Your exit. Now, this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs like to pretend is not really all that important, but everyone would love to see a large chunk of money land in their bank account. Unfortunately, it's never that simple, which you have portrayed to me as you were going through the process. I remember a lot of really interesting conversations about the process of selling. And I'm wondering if you can give us kind of a bit of a summary of how that happened, because it happened over a period of months, right? We had reached a point where we knew we couldn't continue with just the two of us. Dave and I, we are kind of being spread thin. We knew we had to either sell the business and sell the brand and kind of say goodbye to our baby, or we needed to start hiring a team of virtual assistants, VAs, um, and other people who could help us take on the workload. And neither of us have built up a team and a company. I don't think that really interested us. So we went with the route of the exit, but we had no previous experience in this. So we ended up hiring a brokerage um, in the Amazon space, uh, and they helped broker our sales. So they, they looked at all of our books. They summarized all of our numbers, built a nice slide deck for us and presented us to all of, um, their clients, uh, potential buyers for our business. Thankfully, we got a couple of offers and we ended up going with, um, a company that we, we were very interested in. They showed a lot of promise to be able to grow the brand. And they were also, um, one of the only ones interested in doing a stock sale as opposed to an asset deal. So, and so we then started the process of due diligence and this is when, yeah, this was two, two and a half months of just intense. Our lawyer, the buyer had their lawyer. We had the brokers in the middle. We had our tax guy. We're Canadians living in Germany with an American LLC. It it just became uh, so overwhelming. There was one day where we had like five back-to-back calls. It was so overwhelming. I've never been through a process like this. And it was nice to have those brokers in the middle because they, they were able to guide us. We were every time we, anytime we felt overwhelmed, we were able to call them and uh, they would talk some sense into us and be like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Don't worry. And yeah, we were able to close uh, and, and uh, exit the company and and sign the deal on um, the 1st of August, the company was gone and we we've remained on as, as advisors because we think it's important. um, And also they see the importance in keeping the brand owners on to help guide them through at least the next few months. It actually sounds like your brokers kind of serve the same service that a flight attendant serves for me when I'm on a plane. I just look at the flight attendants and as long as they're calm, then I'll be okay. Yeah. And I guess that's, that was, that's your brokers. That was the brokers for us. Yeah. Oh my God. I don't know. I don't know what I would have done without them. As long as you feel they've earned their money, then yeah, I guess that's, that's what's important at the end of the day. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about today and what you're up to now. So you had mentioned to me before that you were thinking about and looking around to get involved with some other existing brands and uh, have you settled on any are you a little more concrete on that now, what you're going to do specifically? I see so much value in continuing to do e-commerce and essentially taking what we just did and, and trying to replicate it again. You know, rather than start at, at square one this time, why not just buy into an existing brand that shows promise and help grow them in the way that we, we grew our own brand? I think tomorrow already officially starts the the due diligence process for this company, this brand that we want to buy into. It's, it's a really cool kind of eco-friendly brand, like forward thinking. Not only that, but we're thinking, you know, not just one brand, but what if we have all of these systems and SOPs in place to the point where you can start to acquire multiple brands and run them all successfully, or at least advise them successfully sure. on how to run. So, mm. So you guys are... You're kind of becoming multipliers. So you're coming in with your expertise and you're able to shift them into that extra gear that you have found when you were doing your own brand. Yeah, essentially strong team that we all work together as opposed to just like acquiring brands and kicking out the whole team and thinking that we can do do what they did on our own. I think that's that's stupid. So we definitely see the value in keeping the whole team together. 
that's going to be very interesting to see where that takes you. And I hope maybe one day you can come back and give us an update on your progress and how your portfolio is shaping up. For our last little bit, uh, we're going to play a game we call win, lose, or draw. I'm going to give Ryan a topic, and he's going to explain to us whether he thinks this is a win, a loss, or a draw. So a win is he thinks it's great, he thinks it's got legs, a loss, not so much, and a draw is i eh, got to kind of wait on it because he's not sure whether it's a win or a loss. So Ryan, are you ready to play win, lose, or draw? Let's do it. All right, our first topic, win, lose, or draw, Amazon remaining at the top of e-commerce. I th- I think it's going to happen, but whether that's a whether that's a win for you know society, I'm not sure. So I'm going to call this a draw. I'm going to say like I can see so many pros and cons in that. As we talked about before, Amazon has its drawbacks, and you never want to see one marketplace totally have a monopoly over over the yeah over the whole marketplace. So. I mean, Amazon's not going to be knocked off the top of the podium anytime soon, I think. So it's, it's, it's a draw for society, but if you're an Amazon seller, it's a win because they're, they're at the top. Good. Nice uh, all-encompassing view on Amazon <laughs> at the top of e-conference. Okay, next one. Win, lose, or draw. You and Dave, aside from your new partnerships, creating another private label brand with a different product. In my eyes, that's a win because, I mean, that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do that now to just bypass the product sourcing, but we're definitely trying to, to uh, grow more brands. And just for the reason that I said before, it, I need to see this out. I need to continue to, to grow more brands and, and do this again to not only prove to myself that it was like, I don't want to think this was a fluke what we just did. I want to do it again to prove like, okay, we kind of know mm-hmm. what we're doing. And it was just fun. So I'm all, I'm all here for it, man. Yeah. Yep. Repeatability. Repeatability gives you confidence. Okay, last one. Last one here. So, uh, win, lose, or draw. Online shopping becoming the main way people in Germany make purchases. Uh, I'm kind of tied between, I'm somewhere between draw and loss on that because if Germany starts shifting into a like really heavy e-commerce, then, you know, a lot of these mom and pop shops are going to go away. And so I really hope this never goes away because I love, I love going out to the local store and getting the, you know, I don't want to get away from that, but like there are times definitely where there's something I need and it's not available locally. So you need to buy it online. So I, I support, I think e-commerce needs to be a shopping option for people in Germany, but I'm afraid if it becomes the main one of, because what that does to the mom and pop. So I'll kind of stay neutral to a little bit of a loss on that. Good call out on that one. Yeah. I think I'd agree with that as well. I really like how Germany still has butchers. Yes. I don't remember seeing a butcher outside of like downtown Toronto in Canada in like the last 10, 15 years. They're all inside supermarkets now. Yeah. You're right. It takes it takes a lot of the personality away from it, I think. Yeah. Good. So that was our round of win, lose, or draw. And that brings us to the end of our Startup Knockout podcast with Ryan Sherrard. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on and giving us a view into e-commerce and the world of biotech that you left behind. So uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, man, Tim. It was a pleasure. Love talking to you. Great. And hopefully we can have you on again at a later date when you're a little further along in this portfolio building. Where, Happy uh, to come back anytime, man. You just let me know. That was our discussion with Ryan Sherrard. Be sure to come back to us next week where we dive into more from the German startup world. You can also look for us on social media. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, and YouTube. Have a good one, everyone.